Now, last week we began a series about fear. And we began at, well, at the beginning, the very beginning of fear, Genesis chapter 3. We watched, every time I read it was sadness as mankind chooses sin over obedience. And then they experience fear for the very first time. And because Adam and Eve sinned there in the garden, that sin and death and fear have been passed down from generation to generation to generation all the way to you and me. And so now fear is a natural part of our lives because of the sin nature we're born with. So that's where fear came from, where it continues to come from. Today I want us to look at where fear lives Last week we talked about where it originated, but where does it dwell? Where does fear hang out? And what can we do to overcome it? And so this message I've just called the battle for the mind. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Excuse me. It says, For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh, since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. When it comes to fear and so many other things, we are in a battle for the mind. Whatever gets your mind gets you. And for many of us, Fear has our minds. We're talking about, and and Paul uses this imagery of strongholds. So when you hear strongholds, I want you to think about this as like an enemy outpost. Our enemy, Satan, is on the attack and he has you and me in his sights. I've said it before, but if we are in Christ, Satan can't take us to hell So he will do everything in his power to bring hell to us. If he can make our lives a living hell, he will do that. And his goal, one of his goals for believers is to establish these outposts, these strongholds in our life where he can manipulate and influence our thinking, our actions, and our decisions. And one of his favorite strongholds in the life of a believer is fear. It takes many different forms worry, anxiety, too literal fear, being afraid of things, sometimes where others would even see it as irrational. But you don't overcome and demolish these strongholds in your life by default. It is through a battle. We're in a battle. And the first thing we need to know about the battle is that it's not traditional warfare. We have an opponent that we can't see. We have an opponent that does not fight fair or play by any rules. Now, we're people of flesh, skin and bone. We're created from the dust of the earth. And so we are naturally drawn to and dependent upon the things of the earth. That's, that's the spheres that we operate in most of the time. Can I see it? Can I hear it? Touch, taste, smell. It's sensory. And although we live in the flesh, Paul says, we don't wage war according to the flesh because the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. It it only makes sense that if you're in a spiritual battle that you would want to use spiritual weapons. And the first thing that you need to understand about the battle for your mind is that it is a spiritual battle. And you don't win spiritual battles with fleshly weapons. The enemy has invaded our territory and set up these outposts, these strongholds in our mind. I once heard a pastor call these strongholds like mental blocks. These are areas where, because the enemy has infiltrated, we don't think the way God intends for us to think. And it even keeps us from seeing things as they really are or acting in ways that honor God. Paul calls these arguments here, areas of pride set up against the knowledge of God. He calls them arguments. And honestly, we get that. Every argument probably that you've ever been in had as its source some area of pride. 
That's the primary reason why you want to win an argument, isn't it? Because of pride. Now, you may push back on that and say, no, no, I want to win the argument because I'm right and they're wrong. And I need them to know just how wrong they are. And I would say that's because your pride is the one that makes you want to win the argument. You can be right without being prideful about it, right? And so these attitudes, these arguments, these strongholds that are areas of pride set up against the knowledge of God. And and honestly, I don't want to do too much of a spoiler right here, but if everything God has said in his word is true, believers literally have nothing to fear. If everything he said is true. Not only that, we have nothing to worry about. And not only that, we have no need to be anxious or filled with anxiety. If everything God has said is true. So if you are, if you are in Christ, a follower of Jesus, and you're filled with fear, worry, anxiety, know this. The enemy has established a stronghold in your mind. An, an outpost. And the arguments about why you should fear, worry, be anxious... These are arguments and attitudes that are in direct opposition to the knowledge or the truth of God. They just aren't true. If what God said is true, then none of those other things can be true. There's a stronghold there. There's a mental block. Spiritual warfare is happening in your life and in your mind. And chances are you don't even realize it. And if you do realize that you shouldn't be fearful or worrying or anxious, then often we try to fight that with a fleshly weapon in the middle of a spiritual fight. Now, I know this. For many, your instinct is going to be to hear this message and to kind of tuck it away for the next time that you are fearful or worrying or anxious. But I want to challenge you this morning that everyone who is hearing me needs this today. They need it right now. And here's why. Because you are under attack. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are under attack. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Now in the Bible, when it speaks of the heart, it's not talking uh, primarily of the, the organ in your chest that is pumping blood through your body. It's, it's not that. In the Bible, the heart is not just this physical organ. It's really not even just one thing. When you hear heart in the Bible, you need to think this. It is the center of your mind, your will, your emotions, and your conscience. They all comprise the heart. So when Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart, it is warning you that something is taking aim at these things. At your mind, at your will, this is where you make decisions. Your emotions, even your conscience, what what you think is right and wrong. Our enemy is targeting us and many Christians, maybe even most, are living as if they don't have a target on their hearts. But they do. You do. And so if you are living as though you are not a target, you're not on guard. You're not protecting yourself. And not only that, As parents, we're often not doing the job we need to to guard the hearts of our kids. As husbands, we are not always doing the job we should be doing to guard the hearts of our wife. Don't don't forget, last week, Adam and Eve, they're in the garden. And the serpent is tempting Eve and her husband is standing right there and he never says a word. He never interrupts and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, honey, I don't think that's what God said. I think that this guy may be trying to, he may be trying to trick us. He doesn't do anything. He just leaves her completely vulnerable and then later just uh, blames her. Our enemy has all the resources that he needs to wage war on a million different fronts all at one time. He can take aim at my mind and yours and yours and theirs and theirs all at the same time. Because we make use of all this amazing technology, don't we? Can I just let you know? We're streaming this service live right now. It's amazing. Who knows how many of our our members and, and guests that are 
tuning in today, and, and Satan knows how to use a computer. He knows how to use the internet. Have you been out there on the internet? He's there. He's all over the place. When it, he knows how to use all the technology. When it was still a thing, he could even program a VCR. He, could do, he knows how to do all the stuff. Our enemy is waging a spiritual war against us. And honestly, he uses our own devices and vices against us. And the scary thing is, is that for many of us, it's not just that we're not guarding our hearts and guarding the hearts of our wives and our husbands and our children. We're actually inviting the enemy right into our homes and onto our phones and onto the TVs in our living room and our bedroom. And we're just letting him right in. So how do we win this battle? How do you win the battle for the mind? I think Paul lays it out for us there in 2 Corinthians. He says, we demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God. And then he says this, and you may have heard this before. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. It's a battle for the mind. We're talking about thoughts. So really, honestly, I have one point for you today and then a few sub points. And that one point's right there in Scripture. Take every thought captive. That, that Greek word there, eikmalizo, it means to control or to conquer or to bring into submission. When you take these thoughts captive, you are saying, I will now control my thoughts. They will not control me. So, Know this, you can't always control what you think, right? You can't, but you can take those thoughts captive. You, you can't always control what you think, but you can control whether or not those thoughts control you. We have to force our thoughts to obey. We have to force our thoughts to submit. And the truth is, is that we can't just try to weed them out and on the fly decipher whether or not those thoughts are obedient to Christ because we have hundreds of them, thousands of them. You, some of you right now, you're thinking about dozens of different things that have nothing to do with what's going on in this room right now. It's amazing, the mind. I've told people before that I can be in the middle of preaching a message and I can think about something else. Like there have been times I get into the middle of a message and I think, man, this is not going well at all. And truthfully, you were already thinking that. You were going, man, this is not going well at all. And you're thinking, I wonder how much longer this is going to go. And I'm thinking, I wonder how quick I can finish this. I just got to get out of here. Land this plane and move on to next week. I, you can do that, right? You can be listening. You can be talking and you can be so many thoughts. And you don't even know where they all came from. Why well, made me think that? Where did I hear that before? We have to take them captive. We, because not only does Scripture tell us to guard our hearts, it also tells us that we can't trust our hearts. Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? It's not just that you have to guard your heart. You can't even trust your heart. There was an 80s song by Roxette, Listen to Your Heart. And that's a lovely sentiment and terrible advice. We can't trust our hearts. You have to take every thought captive. So how do we do that? The first thing is this. Don't believe everything you think. It's going to get deep in here. Are y'all going to be okay? Don't believe everything you think. We have to take every thought captive and then constantly compare it, compare what we think to the truth of Jesus Christ and then force that thought to submit. So, so think of it this way. If what you think doesn't line up with the truth of Scripture, guess what's wrong? Your thought. How about this? Remember, we're guarding our hearts. And what is our heart? It's the center of our mind, our will, our emotions, and our conscience. What happens if you feel something? 
I take that feeling and I compare it to the truth of Christ. What happens if what you are feeling, maybe it's fear, maybe it's anxiety, if, that does, if it's inconsistent with the promises of God and the past faithfulness of God, guess what? You did feel that, but your feeling lied to you. So you have to take it captive. Don't believe everything you think. Just because you think something doesn't make it true. And not only that, not only do you not believe everything you think, you don't need to believe everything you see and hear. Do you, are you aware that the, the eye has the optical nerve that is connected straight to the brain and every time you see something, there is an exchange of signals happening there? And it's been said that there are more signals coming from the brain to the eye than from the eye to the brain. And that's because your brain is actually telling your eye what it's seeing. Well, if your mind can't be trusted, you can't always trust, you, you can't always even trust what you see. Your brain, your mind, your heart is actually telling your eyes what you're seeing. And that's why five different people can see something happen and all five of them report something different. And it's not just what we see, it's what we hear. A politician from either party can end a speech like this. God bless America. And people on one side, I don't know if it's this side or this side. My right or yours. will say, you see that? He loves God and America. And people on the other side will go, we need separation of church and state. He's just pandering to Christians. We hear what we want to hear. We see what we want to see. Just because you think it doesn't mean it's true. And don't trust everything you see or hear you can't trust your eyes or your ears because you can't trust your heart and your mind and your emotions because you have biases and presuppositions that are influencing and filtering what you see and what you hear. And the scariest part about a true bias is that you don't know you have it. We talk about biases, right? We'll say something like this. I've got the most beautiful kids in the world, but I'm a little bit biased. And here's why we say that. It's because we actually know that there could and probably are children that are more beautiful than our children, but we really love ours more than any of the rest of them. A true bias, you don't say I'm a little biased. When you're truly biased, you don't know you're biased. You have a bent in that direction. You don't even know it's there. So if I have a bias that's influencing, influencing what I think and what I see and what I hear and I don't even know what's there, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to take every thought captive and then I'm going to have to force it to submit to the knowledge of God, the truth of God. And that's, that's really the last thing here. We have to grow in the knowledge of God. We demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against what? Against the knowledge of God. I don't have to over-preach this point. If you, you will fail in this if you lack the knowledge of God. That's one of the reasons why it's so important that we know God's word, that we are in communication with him that we are living spirit-filled lives. It's because that's the difference between us walking this out in our lives and us continuing to allow the enemy to take more and more and more ground in our life. You can't submit your thoughts to the knowledge of God if you don't have the knowledge of God. And here's the thing, God wants this for you. He provides it by his spirit. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives it generously and ungrudgingly and it will be given to him. I love that, ungrudgingly. Because our heavenly father, he's not anything like some of us are as fathers, right? Where our kids come and they ask us the dumbest question you've ever heard. And all you want to do is go, seriously, that is the dumbest question I've ever heard. But our heavenly father never does that. When we go to him and say, oh, I, I want to know more about this. He doesn't go, seriously, you again? It's every day with you. When are you going to get? He never does that. Anytime you seek him, you find him. Anytime you desire more of him, you get it. And you want to grow in wisdom. You want to grow in knowledge. 
Ask. He gives it generously, giving you more than you deserve and probably more than you ask for. And ungrudgingly, he loves it. He provides it by his spirit. Grow in your knowledge of God. And and one more thing here. Focus your mind. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, amazing list. Whatever, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Allow your mind to live there. You could think of it this way. Allow those things to take up residence in your mind. Stephen Furtick says, fear and faith are both products of focus. I love that. What is your mind focused on? Proverbs instructs us to guard our hearts, to be on guard. And this is more than just a battle of flesh against flesh. This is a spiritual war And our weapons must be up to the challenge. We need weapons that are powerful because of the power of God. And Jesus makes this possible. Don't miss this. Part of being a disciple of Jesus is learning how to counter and overcome the attacks of the enemy. This means we have to to go on the offensive. Because rather than just resisting resisting those thoughts, we need to actively, intentionally replace them. What, where, what is our focus? What is it that we're actually thinking on? What are we dwelling on? We need to not just resist, we need to replace. So that means it isn't just putting a filter on your internet, although you should do that. Because again, the enemy's out there. It, it isn't just saying, I'm gonna avoid movies that have more than uh, X number of cuss words. It's, it's not just about those things. It's not just resisting, it's replacing. And what do I replace it with? Philippians 4.8. Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, whatever has moral excellence and is worthy of praise, dwell on those things. Because the places most of us are dwelling, there may be some little bright spots of that, but, but the enemy is there. And we're, we're, we're letting him in through our phones and through our TV screens and God knows through our social media. I mean, honestly, the people on staff and my family know, but I've basically unfollowed everybody on social media. If you see a post from me, it's probably pretty rare and here's why. Because the devil is there. I'm just gonna tell you. Like there's not a whole lot of what is true or what is honorable, or what is just, or what is pure, or lovely, or commendable, or morally excellent, or worthy of praise. So I I, I can't just resist. I've got to replace that. I'm just going to tell you, if you're wanting wanting your mind to dwell on these things, you're not going to find it on 24-hour cable news. It's not there. Again, I'm not saying that there's never any, there, there's, there's not there's some bright spots of light there, but there's so much darkness. And we've got to not just resist, we've got to replace it. Because fear, like worry or anxiety or even anger, is ultimately a status of the mind, of the heart, of the feelings, and it overflows into our actions. But for followers of Jesus, whatever the thing is that's causing fear or anxiety or anger, whatever that thing is, it is always lying to you. Because if what God said is true, then we have nothing to fear. Last week we considered the passage that said we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and that last little part's translated differently in a lot of different translations. One of my favorites, though, is it says, and a sound mind. 
sound mind. This is a battle for the mind. So we must take that thought, that feeling, every thought, every feeling, that emotion captive. Because this is a war. And we are absolutely here to take prisoners. We need to take every thought captive because the enemy is invading. And the front line of this battle is between your ears. And whatever gets your mind gets you. Wherever your mind is living is where your actions are going to live. What are you dwelling on? Is it what is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and morally excellent and worthy of praise? So as we respond to this this morning, here's what I know. I know that for some of you, the first realization you had today was, holy cow, I'm under attack. Like right now. Like I was sitting here in this message and the enemy started trying to insert thoughts into my mind that are in opposition to the truth of God. Doubts and fears and worries and anxious thoughts. And I got to get my guard up. I, I've, been, I've been completely vulnerable. And not only that, I've actually opened the door and invited the enemy right into my house. And I have got to get into the fight. But know this, it is, it is not a fight against flesh and bone. The person on the other side of the street, the other side of the country, the other side of that screen, they're not your enemy. Satan is our enemy. And if you're a follower of Jesus, there is a target on you. It's not on your back, it's on your heart. And he is taking aim. And he is getting far too many victories. Let's, let's, let's begin the change of that today.